Hey everybody, what's up? It's Chase. Welcome to another episode of the Chase Jarvis Live Show here on Creative Live. You know the show where I sit down with amazing humans and do everything I can to extract from their brain and share it with you. And my guest today is Ellen Bennett. Now, if you're in the food world, you know who Ellen is. If you are not, be prepared because Ellen started working at nine years old around her house, moved to Mexico by herself at the age of 18, back to the United States, and walked into the back door of a Michelin two-star restaurant got herself a job as a line cook, and the rest, as they say, is history. She today runs Headley & Bennett, which is an apparel company that specializes in premium chef aprons. Now, it sounds like a small business, a huge multi-million dollar business supplying uh, chef wear for the best in the business, Nobu, David Chang, uh, April Bloomfield, the, the best of the best. And if you've ever wanted to start a business in an area that you love, this episode is for you. Again, her upbringing in Mexico, single mother, and and took all of her upbringings, mashed them together and said, what do I want to be or become in this world? And did it. Uh, She talks in this episode about how to maintain creativity while building a business. Um, She talks, there's this great analogy of things are breaking all the time, right? And sometimes you have to get off of the bike in order to fix the bike. Uh, And we also, of course, talk about our new book, which is, I have right here, Dream First, Details Later, How to Quit Overthinking and Make It Happen. Uh, This woman is a firecracker. You're going to love her, her personality, her story is incredible. And if you've ever doubted yourself, this will likely be the inspiration that will get you going. So I'm going to get out of the way. And again, back to the episode here with Ellen Bennett, CEO and founder of Headley and Bennett. Ellen, thank you so much for being on the show. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Yeah, I'm so excited to be here. Day two of my giant uh, book tour situation. Congratulations. Speaking of book, you know, we usually dance around it for a little bit, but congratulations. (laughs) It is amazing. And then I had to throw it all out there. (laughs) No, it's amazing. It's beautiful. It's well-designed. And obviously, um, I want to talk about the meat that's in there because there's a lot of it. Um, first of all, it, it, for those who are the unlikely few who don't know your story, I'm hoping you can orient us in time and space before you were famous, before you had book deals and were making aprons for the uh, the most recognizable people on the planet. Um, take us back to childhood and what were your interests? What was your childhood like? And orient us in time and space. Yeah. Totally. It was it was really a wonderful childhood, even though it was an unusual one. I am half Mexican and half English. So there's this awesome combo as I was little where I would run around the streets of Mexico barefoot playing football, football, as they football. like to say in Mexico, <laughs> football. Um, and then in L.A., I was having Walker's cookies and drinking tea with my English grandfather, who was a rocket scientist for Boeing. So it was very unusual. And when I turned nine, roughly speaking, my parents had a very rough divorce, like world exploded type of a divorce. Mm. And it was like my whole world kind of exploded again. Can I say that word enough? You can, Just you to can, like really you can, yeah. uh, drive the fucking point home. Sure. Uh, two times like in two telen- sentences is fine. It's fine. Yeah. It was, it was a telenovela explosion. So that went down and that really rocked my world in a way that could have been the worst thing that ever happened to me, but I kind of made it the best thing that ever happened to me. So I went from having a nice family home situation to now I was being raised by my magical Mexican single mother uh, by my by herself in Glendale. And it was fucking hard. Not going to lie. It was yeah. very dramatic to have that shift. And I really had to kind of find my way in the world. And a lot of my friends had a, what seemed like a perfect family. And I really had a lot of things... Uh, that were just different scenarios. So I kind of felt like a little weirdo when I was little. 
and I had big crazy hair and everybody had straight perfect hair and everybody was blonde and I was this little you know Mexican lady girl that was just running around with a lot of opinions about things and so I just kind of constantly found my own way in the world and when I was around 14 15 I, my mom's a nurse, so she was working 14, 15, you know, crazy hour shifts. Crazy, yeah. Crazy ass hours. I said, I got to help. I got to help. Like, I don't know how I'm going to help, but I'm just going to figure it out. And I had just made the decision. And so I started writing the checks for bills because I had school. I had learned how to write checks. So I was like, okay, I should apply. Oh, get a home ec class and like, what is that, eighth Literally. grade? <laughs> yeah. And so I started doing that. And then I was like, well, I'll walk my sister to school. I'll start to figure out how to cook because I don't know how to cook. My mom doesn't know how to cook and I love cooking. And just my mother was so willing to let me learn and not put any pressure on failure at all. Like it didn't even come up that I just decided I could do stuff. And then I did it. And she was like, cool, rock on. I'm going to go to work. You do you while you're here. And, and that was kind of like my youth. It was, it was different, but it was wonderful. I want to I want to check in on two things. One, you said that you found yourself not fitting in. You, you used your hair yeah. and you used a little bit of maybe home experience. Is that yeah. like how did was that an identity for you, outsider, um, or was that just a is that a convenient story now? You know, twenty years on, like how how much in your head were you yeah. then about like, oh my gosh, I don't look like my friends. I don't act like my friends. My home isn't like my friends. What, what, give me a yeah. little bit more there. Cause I think the reason I'm asking is because, you know, the people yeah. who are listening and watching right now, the reason that they are tuned into this show is because you are clearly someone who has found that thing in the world that you're supposed to do. You've tapped into that. And there are so yeah. many people in the world yeah. who have not, and they've told themselves a story yeah. as we all have at one point in our lives or another. Yeah, We've told ourselves stories about who we are, what we, that, that we yeah. are sort of the sum of our past. And what I've yeah. come to believe is that, you know, we can change that. What you did yesterday doesn't actually define yeah. who you are today. So I'm trying to understand totally for, for the, the audience here, like that you didn't always have your shit together and eclectic is one yeah. way of upbringing, but how did you, you know, how did that yeah. make you feel relative to the headspace that say you're, you're in now? Yeah, totally. It, it just made me feel like I was not like all the other crayons in the Crayola box. And so I guess just kind of embrace it for what it is. And I also at the same time was going to Mexico and having all these fun experiences with friends who, by the way, had no money, had homes that didn't even have floors. And then I, on the flip side, I had my friends in LA who had a lot more money and were kind of miserable. So while I was experiencing the feels that I was feeling, I was seeing visibly that money actually didn't have that much to do with it. Um, and I wanted to just find my way. And so I thought, all right, well, let's just kind of find, find that way and just start doing things that you like, because, well, you don't seem to be like anyone else anyway. So just, just be you. Um, and the thing that I always kind of remember was when I was young and my mom was working all day long, she gave me this liberty where I literally would, there's one time that I just, I can't even believe she let me do this, but I went to Home Depot and I bought a couple of cans of paint and I painted the living room like this beige color. I painted, spun painted her bedroom yellow and I painted the kitchen green. And she got home at like eight o'clock at night after being at the hospital all day. And she was like, oh, that looks nice. Okay, going to bed. Bye. Like it didn't even, she didn't even flinch. It was just like, I just painted her whole fucking house and <laughs> she was <laughs> totally okay with it. And it, she allowed me to show up as my own self and said nothing about it. So I was just like, man, this is cool. All right. Well, maybe out in the world, I'm just a little different, but here at home, I can be whatever the hell I want to be. And so I'm just going to keep doing that. And she made that environment really safe for me to be creative. So by the time I was old enough, I turned 18, I decided I was going to move to Mexico City. And I really felt more comfortable in Mexico as a person. And I remember landing in Mexico and just being like, holy shit, I'm not weird. I'm just Latin. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm loud and I've got opinions and I love color and I want to hug people. 
and I want to say hi and I want to bust into your house and see what you have in your refrigerator. Okay, is that not normal? Maybe it's not, but I don't care. Have you have you asked your at, at sub, subsequently were you able to have communication with your mom about your upbringing and say was this intentional or were you just too busy to care or did you want to carve out a space for me because I was weird or like, yeah. I, and I'm thinking about the parents who are listening right now too. They're, yeah. you know, we're, we're, we run programs and the programs are cultural norms and they're telling us who yeah. to be and how to program our kids. And I'm trying to yep. uncover a little bit about what your, did your mom know that she was bringing you up that way or was that intentional? I actually just had a conversation with her about this because she said to me, you know, I really regret not having spent more time with you guys when you were little. I was trying to give you everything you could, I could give you by working a lot, but I wish I could have taken you on more vacations and things like that. And, you know, I, I asked, I was like, I, you know, were you okay with just like letting me do all these things? And she said, I just never assumed you would fail on it. I just didn't think twice about it. I, I, I don't know, you were, you've always been so just willing to learn things that I wanted to give you that, you know, space to do it. And I was working, so I just let you do it. So she really didn't have some sort of structure to it. It was just, it kind of came That's together. Incredible. Yeah. And she said to me, you know, after your dad and I got divorced, it was like the world had ended, but yet you were my world and I still had you. So I had everything I needed. And you guys were my strength in all of this, which is just like, oh, to hear my mother have said that at 33 years old when this happened when I was nine. I mean, we just had this conversation a week ago. It was, yeah, it gets me, it gets me teary eyed because I was just like, wow. Okay. So we were the strength that kept you going and you were the strength that made me feel like I could go out and do things. And, you know, my mom was raised on a tiny little ranch in the middle of Mexico where all of her sisters had to clean homes to get her through college. Like it was not an easy beginning. And I love sharing that because people think you need MBAs and trust funds and you need to come from a long line of money to make yourself somebody in the world. And that's just not true. It really isn't. Well said. And to jump forward, that you you were in Mexico for some time, and at some point, you decided to come back to the U.S. And I'm curious, in your sort of your life arc, what drove you back to the U.S.? And then I understand that you went to work in a kitchen when you got here. But um, yes. so first, what drove you back? And then when you got here. Why kitchen? Was it a choice? Was it a, a default? Was it the first job you you thought you could get, or was that? Yeah. Uh, did you understand that you wanted to um, that you wanted to cook because of all of the yeah. childhood stuff? Right. Well, I went to Mexico for two months. That was the plan, and I ended up staying for four years. So from 18 to 22. And there was a time when my mom was like, okay, this is getting a little crazy. I thought you were just going to go for a little bit. Now you're living there and you just got your Mexican citizenship and you're, you know, renting a house. Like, what, what are you doing? And I just really wanted to find my way in the world. Similar to when my parents got divorced and I was just sort of like, oh my God, what am I going to do with my life? I just had to start walking forward. And I feel like this was an extension of that. It was Ellen going out into the world and finding her own way and finding the thing that made me excited. And I loved food and I wanted to be in food. I couldn't afford culinary school in the U.S., so it made sense. Go to Mexico and see if you can get into school there. And I had 8 million jobs while I was there. I knew nobody. <laughs> I had to, like, find my way in the world. And there's a little – I don't know if you saw it, but there's a page in my book that shows – all of the jobs that I had. And find I it. think it's, you got to find it because okay. you, people feel embarrassed sometimes about the windy journeys that they go on to find their special place in the world. And I did a lot of weird shit to get to my place in the world. I was the lottery announcer on television in Mexico. I sold Christmas trees. I was a, um, 
English tutor for kids. I was a booth babe, which means like when you go to a trade show and you have a woman in a suit with like a Miss America stash across <laughs> the front or sash, whatever it's called. And it stash. says, you know, like stash, just a big mustache. Uh, it says like Banamex or Bancomer for banks. And I would talk to people all day long about everything from bulletproof vehicles to canola oil. I mean, it was eclectic. And all of my friends back at home were going to good schools and starting to get married and buying a nice car. And Ellen was in Mexico being a booth babe. Like it was crazy. Uh, but I learned a ton and I learned how to talk to people and I created what I like to reference in the book. I was building my confidence belt, frankly. I was trying shit. I was living life. I was in the world, not afraid of what was going to happen to me, but simply being in it and getting smashed in the face sometimes by life, but getting back up again the next day. And that gave me a shit ton of willingness to just show up and try. So, but it seems like that was embedded in you early on because of the divorce, because your mom was yeah. so trusting and hands off and had so much confidence in you yeah. that there was this underlying tone of confidence. But one of the things that I, again, I just want to say congratulations on the book. And for those who are listening, uh, dream first, how to quit overthinking and make it happen. Uh, dream first details later, by the way, it's just a beautiful, beautiful book. I highly recommend. But one of the things that comes through there is you're talking about it now, like you had confidence, you had this experience, you with your parents and your childhood in Mexico, and a lot of people don't have that. So in the book, you you articulate how to actually build this, um, what I would call sort of a, the skill of confidence by doing yeah. things by doing things that scare you. And so I'd love to get a prescription from you on this for those yeah. who weren't lucky enough to be raised by a uh, uh, Latina mother who was willing to let you paint the house at 14. <laughs> <laughs> totally. So, you know, think of it as like a savings account. Every time you do something that's out of your comfort zone, it can be, you know, getting an internship somewhere, asking for an opportunity that you don't know if you're going to be able to land. And then you get the opportunity and somehow you land it and you, you complete what you said you're going to do. Those can be big and little moments in your life, but you're accumulating these notches in your savings account. And then a bigger opportunity comes along. And you're like, all right, I've shown myself that in many occasions I committed and then I delivered. Maybe I can do this one too. And so it's just putting yourself in uncomfortable scenarios like that where you're just like, I want to try. And you know what? Maybe I'm going to fail, but that's okay too. And I tried so many things and failed at so many of them, but then I'd have a couple successes in between that would just fill me up with passion. And I was like, oh, I like how that feels more than when I fail. So let me just try that one more time. And that kept me going to the next thing. Um, and that's really what it's about. Like, I really feel that people have a misinterpretation of opportunities. They just come landing on your doorstep and everyone's waiting for their big moment. But I believe it's lots of tiny little moments where you show up for yourself and you build those own, your own opportunities, right? When I first started my company, nobody knew who the hell I was. Nobody cared about an apron. They're like, apron? What? Grandma's aprons? Like, what are you talking about? It, I had to be my own cheerleader for years before people got on the bandwagon with it. But I had a deep passion. That feeling I mentioned earlier was so alive in me when I realized that I loved doing that, that I wanted more of it. It's like I was hooked. And so you just got to put yourself in enough situations until you find the thing that lights you up like a fucking light bulb. And then you go after it. And don't All be right. afraid when you feel that so feeling. I'm going to go fast forward for just a second uh, for those who, again, are uh, who don't know what you're talking about is Headley and Bennett, your um, manufacturing company made collaborations for around aprons with uh, Madewell, Vans, Michelle Obama. Um, you, you switched, you pivoted, you've been making face masks through the pandemic. There's an amazing story that's really at the core of my experience. This is how I first came into you and your work. But you said two things that I want to retrace real quick. One was 
you failed lots of times. And I'm wondering if you can share a couple of those. And are these sort of per- personal and, and small failures? Are there any public ones? And how did you, yeah. did, did you think of them as failures along the way? And I think, again, mostly trying to put ourselves in the, in the shoes of the listener right now, who's yeah. saying, yeah, you know, I want to go after my stuff, but I'm terrified of failure. I can't afford it because I have a mortgage and three kids and, you know, whatever the list of, of reasons yeah. that each of us have, but share with us a couple, yeah. what, what, what you thought were some of your failures along the way. Totally. Pre, pre-business or post-business? Sure. Yeah, there's let's, a let's, whole let's, mountain. <laughs> well, I, I like the pre because it, to me, it's the setup. Okay. For, yeah. for the company. For sure. So when I lived in Mexico and I had all these wild jobs, I had a big job that I got that was for, you know, some modeling gig that I was going to do and I was going to be on a billboard and it was a whole big deal. And I called one of my booth babe jobs that I had actually booked already for that day. It was like working for a bank and I was going to make very little money, but I, that was the job I had first committed to. And then later I heard, you're going to get this big opportunity. So I called them and I was like, guess what? I got this incredible job. I'm so excited. And I was fully freelance. So any job I landed, you know, it was a big deal because you were kind of living month to month. And I called the guy and he basically threatened me on the phone that he would sue me if I quit if I didn't show up for that bank job and that I would lose everything I had built in Mexico and that I was going to be nobody and that it was just kind of like the end of the rope in booth babe land. And I, it was honestly the thing kind of sustaining me in so many ways. I worked four or five different booth babe jobs a week on top of going to culinary school on top of being, you know, an English tutor and all these other funny jobs I had. And I was terrified of that. And I also was really committed to committing to things. If I said I was going to do it, I was going to do it. So anyway, he threatened me. I called the other company and I said, can we move the date? Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I don't know if I can do this. And in the back and forth for about 30 minutes, they called me back and they're like, we gave it to somebody else. Sorry, you're moving on. And I was just like, oh my God. Like this was just to put it in perspective. The amount of money I would have made in that day would have been, you know, the equivalent of like two months of work. And I was trying to make it things right. And then this guy threatened me and I thought I was going to get sued and I had nobody to turn to. I was like 18 or 19 years old. And suddenly I had lost that job and I kind of almost lost the other job too. And I felt like such a loser for not having the answers, for not knowing how to navigate the situation, for just not having said, I'm going to do it anyway. And that was like one of 50 things that happened all the time where you just didn't have the answer and you thought you were doing the right thing because you're trying to be honest. And then people were just screwing you over left, right and center because it's like this young girl who's from the United States, but really she's Mexican, but really she's white. So it's fine. And it was, it was challenging. And that same month, the landlord where I lived, we would pay him cash sometimes. And it turns out he ran off with everyone's money for the entire year. So you had the entire building who was paying this guy, some people in check, some people in cash. He ran off with everyone's money and didn't pay those rents. And then we all had to repay the rents that this guy didn't pay or we would get kicked out because we had no proof since we had paid him cash. So it was just like money issue after money issue in lots of different ways, some big or some small, that were giant blows when you're, you know, 19 year old living by yourself in Mexico City. And I had to just persevere because I had convinced my parents that I could live alone in Mexico and I couldn't go running home to tell them I needed help. How much, how much of that was in the equation? Like, do you believe if you want to take the Island that you have to burn the boats? Was that, was that a huge uh, thing for you to, to move to Mexico and be able to prove to yourself? And presumably it sounds like your family members that you could do it, that the pressure is, is pressure required or is there a lightweight way to, uh, to build that muscle? You just threw yourself into the sharks, the deep end. Is that, is that required? It's it's definitely not required. I think I am a high pressure, high horsepower, high adrenaline kind of a human. But 
you don't have to move to Mexico to and you know get screwed many times to build confidence. I'm just telling you some of the really shitty situations that happened along the way while I was trying to make it in Mexico, which at times felt like I was not making it. And it took me many years to really recognize and acknowledge all those kooky situations that happened to me as moments to learn. Because when, believe me, when that was happening, it was the worst feeling in the world. And so sometimes take some time to kind of think back and say, you know what, that was, I'm really glad that happened to me. That shitty situation taught me so much about how to show up in the world. But that's, that's a huge theme of the book too, right? Yeah. Just this idea of showing up over and over and getting rid of the belief that it's going to be perfect. And you've cited a couple of times yeah. your, your Latin roots, like being around people that didn't have a floor, <laughs> I think was yeah. an example you use. Like, yeah. the, you know, it's just, it does away with this little pretty perfect world. And that was, I think, probably the primary, my primary and favorite theme, just this willingness to build confidence over over time and through experience. And speaking of yeah. experience, you then, so you decide after your mom's like, yo, been four years, you, you, <laughs> yeah. you go back. And my understanding is you started working at, at Providence. Is that right? That's right. And I'll tell you one, one last thing that was really important for my journey in Mexico. I'd been there for four years. At this point, I had a pretty established world. I had a, a nice place to live. I was making really consistent money. I had I had built I had built a life, and I was like, "Hell yes, this is awesome! I did it! I built something out of nothing." I had I showed up as, as this young kooky girl, and I was really like this woman now at the end of it. And I looked around at that, and I thought, "Okay, so I'm 22. Is this?" is this it? Like, did I make it? <laughs> and I, I kind of just knew in my heart of hearts, there's got to be more out there in the world. And you have your culinary career now that you need to go actually pursue. This is all fun and comfortable, right? You've gotten through the uncomfortable parts, but are you just going to sit there and like not use the career you came back to Mexico to do? And so at that moment, I made the tough decision of just selling all of it and moving back and really starting from zero again. But it was the best thing ever because I recognized that it wasn't all the stuff I had accumulated in Mexico that made me. I had made me. And I was going home with me and all these experiences and all these notches on my confidence belt with a very different perspective on life. And so I did return home to my mother's house, living on my own, uh, from living on my own to now living with mommy. And making very little money in the U.S., but I was like, I got, I got to do this. This is, this is the time. So you come back to, you can go back to the U.S. Yes. And you decide to dive into the culinary world because that's what you've been studying. You went down to Mexico. You're gonna bring it back full circle now. Yep. Yep. You show up at Providence. You're working at Providence, and and this is where prior to doing a bunch of research on you, this is where I thought your story began didn't didn't understand the whole Mexico journey before the book um, and you're working in a kitchen and something interesting happens that shapes the next chapter of your world and so I'm wondering yeah. if you can tell it in your own words for yeah. uh, for everyone who's listening totally so I get back I ask a friend how do you work in restaurants how does that work in the US what can I do and I was always really willing to ask a lot of questions to anybody who had answers. And she had gone to culinary school. So in my mind, I'm like, all right, she's she must be professional. This is great. She said, you got to go to the top restaurants in LA. Here's a list. Go between 2 and 4 p.m. and you'll get a job. I promise. Just walk in through the back door. Not a big deal. And I was like, oh, that's easy. That's what I did in Mexico for four years. Let's go. So I walked into Providence and apparently you don't do that at a two Michelin star restaurant. You actually have to have an email and a referral and something else. And long story short, I got a job there by walking up to the chef and saying, I'm Mexican and I have the work ethic to prove it. And I would love to have an opportunity to work here and your restaurant is incredible. And he was like, okay, fine. I'll give you a shot. And I, I got my little window in and I started working there and I knew nothing compared to these guys. I mean, it was a fucking army 
of chef sergeants in there and people just knew what was up. And I thought I was big time because I had gone to school in Mexico and all this stuff. And man, was I really brought down to reality in there. And I was making $10 an hour and I was at the bottom of the rung in, uh, you know, the lineup. So I would get in there. I was working my ass off. I got another job at another restaurant and I was a personal chef for a family. So now I had three jobs. And one day while I was working, we were all just kind of making great food, beautiful food. I was climbing the ranks or whatever. And I was just like, Jesus, our uniforms like really suck. Why are they so bad? We kind of look shitty. We feel shitty. They're paper thin. The pockets are always ripping off. The straps don't work. I want to make them better. So I have one one size fits all too, right? And they're like very generic. Yeah. Yeah. The big guys and little ladies and all the sizes. And they're just like a sheet with straps on it. And they're delivered from a linen service and they're made out of polyester and they're just terrible. So that idea hit my mind. And I was like, oh, but I can do chef coats and all these other things. But chef coats seemed hard and daunting. And I just wanted something that people could put on and feel good immediately. And so the idea, the inception had happened. It was just like, boom, idea. And then a few weeks later, my other chef said to me, hey, there's a girl. She's going to make us aprons. Do you want to buy one? And it was very casual. He just kind of like threw it out at me. And it was like, (laughs) someone's got my job already. What? (laughs) I'm like, what? Somebody else is thinking about this? Oh, my God. And I, in a matter of seconds, just blurted out to my chef, I have an apron company, I will make you those aprons. And it just like, it, it came out of me like a, like a wave of water. And he was like, what are you talking about? You're a line cook in my kitchen. And I said, chef, I I have an apron company. I just started working on it. You don't understand. Like we can do this. You tell me what you need and we'll make it happen. And he had said something. He said, the girl's going to take like five weeks to make it. It's taking too long. And I was like, I can do it in four. Let's do it. And he was like, all right, deal. I need 40 aprons. Make it happen. And out of nowhere, I had an order and I had myself a company. And that's how Headley and Bennett was born. And no, I had no company. I had no sewers. I had no MBA. I had nothing but myself. Wow. So there, there is a theme of burn the boats because you just put yourself in there as a, you know, 18 year old in Mexico, then 22. And despite not recommending that to everybody, that is, it seems like it's a part of, it's a part of you, right? Is that the, is that a fair statement or am I putting words in your mouth? This sink or swim concept. I think it's a constant reminder to myself that I'm stronger than I think I am. And to never forget that. And by doing these crazy and scary things, I just don't unstretch my mental muscles once I go there. And I'm looking for something bigger and scarier and wider and have more, having more impact. And I just, I love that feeling of seeing something in my head and imagining it and then making it come to life. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't you think that that's like, Really, the DNA of most entrepreneurs is yeah. the imagination to reality. Yeah. It's the best part. It's so it fucking exciting. Well, let's fast forward again because uh, I'm, I'm thinking I, I was on the receiving end of an interview just a few days ago, and a question was asked to me about, you know, over time, how does, you know, your view on risk change? And it occurred yeah. to me that, that, at the beginning, it's like, fuck it. I'm all in. Sure. I'm going to make yeah. these aprons five weeks. You know, it's like six minute abs. I'll give you five minute abs. I'll give, I'll do one better. So you, you know, you're making the, you made the aprons a week, in, you know, a week yeah. faster than the, the other, uh, purveyor had promised because you had nothing to lose. Totally. So, so now let's fast forward. You, you know, you've got a very successful com- company. Headley and Bennett is now making, um, aprons for, you know, some of the, collabs you've already done that I mentioned before for Michelle Obama and Vans yeah. and Madewell. And now you've got something to lose. Yeah. So, you know, over time has your, from the 18 year old you saying, fuck it, I'm gonna live in Mexico to now the 34 year old you. 33. 33. 33. Okay. Didn't take, didn't mean to give you an extra year there. 
this, this interview. It's okay. It's okay. Nine years of being, I'm like 95. I'm like 95 in entrepreneur years. So don't worry. <laughs> okay. So like now, I mean, it, it, it seems like when you're 18 and you don't, you don't have much to lose. Right. And yeah. now you've got a career, you've got a name, yeah. you've got staff, you've got a book, you have a career, you have what's, you know, what allows you to keep trying new things, to keep pushing, yeah. to keep risking. Isn't there some sort of aversion? Yeah. And this is really, this underpins the theme of another theme of the book, right? This thing yeah. about, about dreaming and, and that you're going to figure it out once you start taking action, but yeah. is it still the same? It is, it's been an evolution. And I think you're totally right that there have been many times where I'm just like, man, I don't know if I can do that anymore in that same way of just showing up and willing it into existence. Like maybe I need to think about it a little bit more, but the thing that has let me continue to dream is I've surrounded myself with people that actually do the process part of it with me and help me think through those things. So I don't like, they let me be creative. I'm the art and they're the science. And mm. that combination is so important to innovation and creativity within an organization. And when companies start to get complacent and stiff, and rigid to the point that they are no longer willing to look at what's happening today, but they're stuck in, well, this is the way things are done. You're screwed at that point. Like it's, it's downhill from there because there's somebody else, some other, you know, sprightly business that's going to come in and do it for you. You, if you don't change the world changes for you. So that is a little bit of the balance that I strike now. It's not about just being impulsive and like leaping into the world and doing whatever the hell I want, like I did in the early days. There is a point in my book where it talks about you got to get off the bike to fix the bike. And that's where the details later mm -hmm. arrives. <laughs> it's like, okay, <laughs> details now, <laughs> right the fuck now. <laughs> and it, you've got to start taking care of those things. And so I have learned to balance it and to respect the art side but also very much respect the process piece that keeps it all afloat, that keeps it rolling and going. And I think if you can balance that and, and be willing to adapt to things when stuff is not working anymore and just have that humility to say, you know, that worked for a long time, but now our customers just don't really care about that anymore. What are we going to do to fix that? How can we shift? That's the important part. Seems like a very natural place for me to inject the question of uh the pandemic obviously yeah. uh the food industry service industry are uh, uh, f and b hammered. Um, hammered so many of my friends are are chefs uh and you just to watch their you know they've been james beard award winners yeah. in 15 restaurants and they're just yep. hammered. decimated yeah. And so here you are, you know, supplying uh, clothing and chef coats and aprons yeah. for David Chang and April Broomfield and Nobu and all these amazing yeah. chefs. And then basically that industry gets the lights turned out. Yeah. And overnight. And, yeah. Overnight. And so as someone who sat at the epicenter of that and yeah. just, you just answered this question about, you know, being nimble and what got you here is not going to be what you get, what, what gets you there. How have yeah. you man how have you managed through the through the um, pandemic and and talk to us about your 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 pivot? Yeah, it was it was a pretty radical pivot. Uh, we didn't have a clear answer of what we were going to do. The shutdown in LA happened around April 16th, 17th, roughly. And I remember going home and just sitting on the couch with my gigantic pet pig, Oliver, 200 pounds of heft sat on the floor next to me and I just kind of put my feet on top of him and was just sitting there with like my hand and my head in my hand. And I was just like, Oh my God. Like I have been working my ass off for eight and a half years now. And we're going to have to go to in tomorrow and shut that factory down. We're going to have to close it down and send our team home. I'm going to have to furlough people I'm going to have to let go of people. This is fucking crazy. 
And I didn't have an answer. I really didn't. I felt frozen in time the night before. And then the, the day of the shutdown, the last day that you're allowed to go into your building and get everything out and basically send everybody back to their houses, I walked in. My team was taking computers out the back door, literally carrying their Mac computers to their cars. And I'm looking at all the rows of sewing machines, the stacks of fabric, the like just expansive space of making things around me. And I just couldn't believe that after everything I had gone through to, as a business owner and as an entrepreneur to get myself to this place and my team to this place, that we just had to shut it down because of something outside our control. That was so hard to process because I had been in this place where I was just like, make it happen. Just make it happen. Just show up and figure it out. And now you had a pandemic a worldwide pandemic, like, what do you do with that? And so I was shutting it all down. And then I went on Instagram for a quick minute. And I was just scrolling through there, kind of ob oblivious to anything. And I saw that Christian Siriano was making uh, had said, Governor Cuomo is running out of, you know, supplies in New York, if he needs face masks, we'll make them reach out to us. And I was like, oh, my God, this guy makes like wedding dresses and fancy dresses for events. Like what? He doesn't make face masks. If he's going to make face masks, we can make face masks. And it just went from the world is ending right now to holy crap, there's an answer. We can actually be helpful in some capacity. And I called my friend who's a doctor on FaceTime and I said, Dr. Bob, what do you need in a face mask? Like what, what is missing in them? How can we do it? Can we make it out of fabric? What kind of straps would we need? Does it need to like shape to the nose? I, I just don't know how this works. And over FaceTime, he showed me what he needed. I grabbed people off my sewing floor who were also packing up. And I said, let's sketch this out. Let's figure this out. We got to do this. And in a matter of hours, we had put together our face mask design. I posted it on Instagram. People went crazy. They were like, oh my God, somebody's doing something about this. And they rallied behind it. And I thought, well, we can't do this on my own. We are going to have to do it as a buy one, donate one model. So that night, my husband and I standing in the building, we had the final design. I was the model. We carried the seamless across the building into the kitchen laid the face mask on the floor, stuffed it with toilet paper so that it would be propped up properly and not look like a flat piece of fabric, took photos of it on our iPhone, put it on my face, threw on some mascara because I had been there all day and night. And he was like, all right, well, I guess we're doing this. And we sent it off to our e-commerce guy. He put it up on, on Shopify. And the next morning we hit live on pre-order and by Monday, this was Saturday, by Monday, we were selling hundreds and hundreds of masks and people were just ready for it. They were like, this girl is rallying, this company is rallying, and I'm going to fucking jump on the bandwagon with her. Let's go. And we called it the wake up and fight mask because that is exactly the feeling I had at that moment was I am waking up and fighting for dear life and I don't know where I'm going to land or what's going to happen, but damn it, I'm going to fucking try and my team's going to try with me. Incredible. Now, again, do you, that was, again, if you look at the title here, Dream First, Details Later, the, that seemed to me to compress everything into, what was that, about 12-hour period, right? Yeah. You're yep. doing, the, doing the dreaming and the details. How much is repetition a piece like how, how do you build these muscles that you're talking to there's a handful of muscles that you know again taking away from the book like this yeah. idea we already talked about building confidence yeah. this idea of taking advantage of opportunity it seems like you've had to probably tried to capture the zeitgeist a couple of times and failed but yeah. you know what 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 is this recognition of the moment and um you know is that a you just were, you were in market in, you know, 48 hours. Uh, yeah. What, what advice do you give? Uh, that's not something that you're taught, right? Yeah. I, it's, it's really, it's listening to your gut instincts on things when there is something happening and knowing what's right and knowing what's wrong and call that cliche, but I genuinely believe you have to have 
good emotional intelligence in the world to really feel what's happening around you. And it could be an employee is not happy, a team member is not doing well, um, you know, a customer is going to leave, like whatever those things are, you have this kind of instinct, right? It's like a, wait, something drawing you to, to do it or to fix it or to try and do something about it. And I had that those feelings were pretty strong when those different moments happened. And I learned to tap into them. And when you show up and try things, yet that instinct gets better. It's not like I was just born with it. And I knew that feeling from the get go, I just kept honing my ability to feel that feel. And when this time occurred, what was I going to do? Just like go home and stick my head in the sand? Like I needed to try and contribute in some way, not just for myself, but like for our team and for our community. And, and there is a feeling that an entrepreneur has of burden on their shoulders that never goes away when you are responsible for other people's livelihoods. And yeah. I thought about that and I felt it. And it's something that never stops. It doesn't matter how successful you get. It's like it can all vanish in a day, just like we saw with COVID. And I wanted to put up the biggest fight we could fight to try and survive for them. It wasn't for me. I was like, all right, if I die trying, like I'm going to figure something else out. I always do. But they need this. Our community needs this. People are shutting their worlds down. Restaurants are closing everywhere. You can't not contribute. Well, for some people and for some industries where, you know, you have so many examples of figuring shit out, throwing a bunch of spaghetti at the wall and making something out of nothing, whether that's moving to Mexico yeah. or your career or the, the apron company yeah. there's lots of obvious examples but even within each of those like in some cases it was your convincing your mom and in the earliest it was convincing your chef to let you make the aprons instead of the other yeah. vendor and so you, there's this uh, another pattern in your life uh and certainly it comes through in the book about and this is another one of those things that this is a reason to buy the book i mean in itself this idea of helping people in a position of power, sometimes, you know, very, very powerful and often skeptical people to take a chance on you. And you've done this over and over and over. And I'm imagining there's some people listening right now that are like, if I just could find that business partner who had the other half of the brain that I don't have, or if I could just, you know, get someone to take a chance on me to let me you know, if I'm a director to make a movie I want to make, but haven't ever, yeah. you know, made something like that before, or if I'm a yeah. photographer, have you, you know, it's like, how, how have you, you've clearly made it a habit. You develop this muscle yeah. of convincing powerful, skeptical people yeah. to take a chance on you. What's behind that? There's a, there's a section that I, I talk about in, in the book where I call it humble enthusiasm and it's my approach to life in a way it there's a sense of humility of like I don't know everything but I'm going to ask a lot of questions and I'm also excited to learn right so it's being excited about whatever you're doing but also being willing to learn and that combination is really something when you jam it together and you know you should try it I'm sure you are that way too but it's just when you talk about something with someone you're telling, you want to tell them like they're your friend and you're sharing something cool. And then you want to know, what do you think of that? Like, do you think that's a good idea? How would you think about it? What are your thoughts on this? And getting people to do that with you makes them collaborate. And then they get excited and then they're kind of committed to what you're talking about now because they're helping you. And because they're helping you, it's like they just got a little piece of it themselves. So in the early days of H&B, Every chef I worked with, I would say, hey, uh, you know, I'm still I'm working on this company. I'd love to come by and show you what I'm up to and get your thoughts on it. It wasn't like, hey, I want to come by and sell you a product. It was like, A, I want to have a friendship with you. And B, I want your opinion. And if C and D become an order, awesome. But if it doesn't, I am so fucking happy to just meet you 
and get to come over and talk about something I'm so pumped about. And that really most of the time led to people buying the product. Maybe not always there in that moment, but I had multiple famous chefs that I had met at an event. They're like, your product is really cool. And you're also very fucking excited about it. And you're making something (laughs) and you're also making something that I actually need. Need. So you're solving a problem for me, right? Like every other uniform sucks. You're making Japanese denim aprons out of LA that look good and feel good. And you can customize them. All right. And then they'd call me when they were on a commercial for, you know, Chrysler or whatever and say, Hey, remember it's Bobby Flay. And I'm like, Bobby, so good to hear from you. What's up? How can I help you? And he's like, I got this commercial. I need aprons in three days. Can you help make it happen? I'm like, I'm on it. And, and then it's like, he'd throw me a bone. I'd help him. And and then suddenly it's like the restaurant industry. When you know somebody who knows somebody, you go to their restaurant, they take care of you. So I just treated Headley and Bennett like a restaurant, but we made aprons instead of food. And it became a real community of people just doing great things. And we were sharing this with each other. So that humble enthusiasm was at the kind of the foundational part of how I got these famous chefs to be excited about what I was doing and to just hear my story and contribute to it with their own two cents. So if humble enthusiasm is the key, are there any like, are there any supplementary skills like just being enthusiastic yeah and and like clearly there's a network right there's a yeah there's a a set of human relationships at work and I'm wondering if you can share you know is that something you're actively working on did you build that or you know it's all night it's it's amazing to have a product that catches on you know you've been digging this ditch for a long time and all of a sudden the world comes to you yeah and and but that doesn't happen overnight. And most no, people who, yeah. And so, it didn't, it didn't okay. happen overnight. Tell I had, it took. it took many, 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 many years. And anytime I had no customers, I was like, all right, I got to do outreach this week because there's nobody around. So I'd get my ass up and I'd head to a farmer's market. I'd head to another food event. I would go out into the world and I would show up and continue to drum up business. And by the way, to this day, my team still does outreach. We still send emails. We still do things to get people excited about the things that we're doing. But I I flipped to a page in the book I wanted to just highlight. Tell me which page. I got mine here. Not taking feedback is not an option. An option. I know that quote from you. (laughs) I've got it in my notes right here, literally. And, you know, you want to hear some of the, like, the things that kept this all going there were, there were many fuck ups in the Headley and Bennett journey where we tried things and it was not, it did not work, but we were willing to stare those errors in the eye and hear where we messed up and then go and modify the things we were doing to make it better. And because of that willingness to learn and to just shift instead of saying, no, we have the answers, we know what to do. Uh, the page is, it's in the special edition. After page 97, it's in that section called, listen, really listen. (laughs) I love how colorful and bright and well-designed the book is. That's just a side note. Cool, cool job there. Let's talk about trust. That's another key aspect because you you have clearly um, delivered on your promises in, in so many different ways. And you talked about that early on in our conversation. Like you get one shot, you deliver, you become... Yeah known as a person who can actually deliver the same is true my background is as as a photographer you you get hired to do the big campaign for nike and then you deliver that and they want okay cool they delivered and ultimately in in so many professional circles just being able to do what you said you were going to do ends up being a differentiator and i find that trust is a really huge uh, part of success. And you yeah. talk about it in the book. In fact, I think there's a whole chapter, if I'm not mistaken, dedicated yes. to it. So trust. It's what, true. What, what, talk to us about the role of trust. I'm like, there it is. Yep. Trust. Chapter, uh, chapter 10, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. For everyone watching and listening, this is the most colorful business book you'll ever see in your life. I really had to uh, convince Penguin Random House to let me go full color on this book. Good work. That's a that's a hard sell. Speaking <laughs> was, of being able to convince wealthy, powerful people. <laughs> oh my God. So 
one of the things with trust, this was after I had to get off the bike to fix the bike part of my journey. Mm. I had been a one man band for a long time. I had been my own sharpshooter and I thought I could just make everything happen by myself because I'd become this independent, you know, since a night, since I was nine years old. And there came a time where I realized I had to let things go in order to grow. And I couldn't actually do it all alone anymore. And I wasn't actually good at everything. There were a lot of pieces that I was not great at. And maybe I was great at telling our story and getting customers and improving our product. But I didn't know everything I needed to know about finances. I didn't know everything I needed to know about setting up an ERP system. How do you structure org charts? How do you make sure that your HR department is right? There's a lot of stuff that was missing. So I had to I had to kind of come to Jesus, uh, literally, in the book. It happens. My One of my, uh, my CFO sat me down with our with another team member. And she was like, we need to have an honest conversation with you. You are running so hard and trying to do everything on your own. You're going to kill yourself if we don't reassess how to do this differently. You need to just adjust. And they said it in such an honest way that it really kind of hit me like a brick in the head. And I realized that I had been running for many years with, on fumes and without structure and trying to drag everyone along. And I had to, at that point, I was like, you're right. This is true. I started crying and I, they were like, we're going to, we think we should get an executive coach and I want you to trust us on this. And I want you to learn how to be a better leader. And we want you to learn how to show up for your team in a way that is not just you doing everything, but it's you adapting to the needs of the company now. And that was very hard. It was very hard to just recognize that I was not being the best that I could be. And we started bringing on other people into the company that could do these jobs and that could take little bricks off of my shoulders and own a piece. And every time I did that and I saw them succeed and I saw them do well, I was like, okay, maybe I can trust a little more and a little more. And I just kept expanding my trust circle until I had a team of people around me that could do some of the jobs that I had been doing all these years and actually do a better job than what I was doing. And that was extraordinarily challenging, uh, going from a line cook to a CEO and, and having to go through that evolution of leadership. It was like, you're, it's, you're really there for your team. You're not there for, for yourself or the idea. It's for everyone else around you. And that wake up call was really visceral. I read the, uh, there's a piece in you on entrepreneur. Uh, the title is I built apron brand Headley and Bennett into a fast success and our lack of structure almost brought us to a halt. So you just shared that, that anecdote and yep. how much, like, did you feel like that was the details later? It, you know, part of the, the two part promise here, dream first yes. the details later. I think yes. so many people, like there's this desire to get everything perfect before yeah. you go out to market. There's this, uh, you know, what is it? Perfect is the enemy of good or the enemy of, of done. progress. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And, and I always tell my team progress is better than perfection. Your story is yeah. It, but it's like, how much do you feel that that keeps people back relative to you? you you've very, been very transparent in your experience. That's I, what I consider a strength is your perfection is not required. You're out there. You're going to sew these things together and have them there on Thursday. Yeah. But yep. that's not, you know, everyone doesn't work like that. So for those folks who are yeah. in their heads and are overthinking, yeah. you know, hinting at your subtitle here, what's yep. the advice? What's the advice? Because that's, that's deeply conditioned shit. That's like family of origin. Yeah. Like don't make any mistakes, yeah. Sally. You know, so do you have I some, know. I mean, aside from the 220 page book, <laughs> give us a couple of kernels of advice. There are really incredible people out in the world that are professionals at what they do and that can show up and support you if you're willing to be helped. 
And I was so busy getting help with the business that I wasn't getting help with myself in a way. And I needed to evolve. And the what was once my biggest strength, which was just show up and figure it out, had now become our biggest weakness. And I recognized that if I didn't adapt that, like everything would get lost in a way, like the company would get lost. And we all have moments in our lives where those reality checks hit and you can either look them in the eye and realize that that's happening or you can ignore them. But that's on you. There's no special bullet for me to tell you this is how you resolve it. It's simply staring at the truth and being self-aware enough to recognize that that is no longer serving you. And do you have the humility to recognize that what used to work doesn't work anymore and you needed to let the fuck go. Just stop doing it and stop trying to be right about it. Be willing to be wrong and be willing to learn. So just that that willingness to learn point, I think is, it's so important. It's so vital. Because if you're willing, you can do anything. You actually can change. And 220 something pages here shows my fucked up evolution from like one place to another place that is a much better place. But I thought I was in a good place. Turns out I wasn't. And I needed to go through that to get to the other side. And every entrepreneur goes through it. We just don't talk about it. But it's real. It's it's really real. And, and that is why I was as honest as I was in this book. Because it's not a pretty journey, but it's not an impossible journey either. Well, there's so much... Um... What's the uh, phrase? I forget the fancy author who said it, but in the particular lies the universal. And you willing to turn your career, your journey inside out and show everybody that it's a method, messy, nonlinear, uh, yeah. two steps forward, one step back um, journey. That's, well, I, first of all, thank you because there's not a lot of, I hate books. I hate, with the hate is a strong word, but I don't like books that, say, if you do perfect thing X and perfect thing Y, then you're going to get this yeah. great result, you know, Z. Yeah. And it's like, nothing in my life ever looked like any of those books that I read. I, want, I, I often have said this in the podcast before, one of my favorite business yes. books of all times is a book by the venture capitalist Ben Horowitz. It's, it's called The Hard Thing About Hard Things. And the titles mm -hmm. in that book are like, how to fire your best friend, how to tell your employees wow. you ran out of money. You know, these are, that's yeah. the real, that's the real world shit. Um, yes. And I was just wondering if you could comment on on how it's the ugly, messy, hard shit that has made you and your story possible, because everyone out there right now who's listening, I guarantee there's yeah. some piece of their brain that's like, yeah, yeah, but my Instagram feed doesn't look like hers or my. Yeah. You know, I only have one sewing machine. and She has 10 or there's yeah. there's some horrible version of comparison going on out there. And right. I'm wondering if you can uh, underscore the point that you made in the book with a couple of other thoughts. Yeah, totally. It's, first of all, comparison is the death of anything good ever. It's the fucking worst. Like, I love Instagram and I hate Instagram. So don't ever use Instagram as the metric of success. Because everything we put on there is awesome, but no one is showing the real shit that's happening in your life. So put that aside and don't go in there if you are not feeling good about life. I would say that first things first, it's simple basics. I put this book in a way that would show people that it is simple little actions that I took to get going. I mean, we didn't even touch on it, but when I first started H&B, I had three jobs and I never spent more than I made on the business. And I reinvested every penny back into the company for several years. And to watch businesses receive $50 million in funding while I had $15,000 in the bank. And if you needed to buy a fax machine, you had to go make the money before you bought the damn fax machine. So do not feel for a minute that I'm some like magical success, overnight success story that just made it. And well, I'm not her. So what does that mean? It's like, no, I'm 33 years old and I'm still on the fucking journey. I still wake up and things still go wrong. 
Things are still not perfect all the time. But am I excited about what I'm doing? Yes. Am I resolving problems for people every day with my company? Yes. And that keeps me going forward. So get out there and find the thing that lights you up like a lighthouse and start finding time to work on it in little pieces, just bite-sized bites. Go with a version one. You don't, you think about Apple. They started with one computer that's very different from what they have now. But if they hadn't started, they wouldn't be where they are today. So just don't go for perfect. Just go for going. Start. Just stop fucking overanalyzing it. Like that is the key to all of this. I built this with nothing. So can you. And stop giving yourself excuses. We are in the best time in our lives to go out there and try something because the world has never been more level set than with a pandemic that happened for one entire year. Like this is your moment. Do it. Incredible. Two small themes before I let you go. Um, one, I'm going to go back to something you said in this conversation. I made a little note here. You said, I'm a Latina, but I'm white. And you, you, you articulated a view of your identity in like 15 words, but you said them really quickly and then we moved on. And I'm wondering what role you feel like your identity has played in your journey and any advice around identity for anyone who is either proud of their heritage, embarrassed of how they got to where they are, has has uh, mm -hmm. imposter syndrome, and whether this is on the lines of ethnic or gender orientation or anything. I'm wondering yeah. if, as someone who identified as having a, uh, a, a different journey yourself, if you have any yeah. advice. Yeah. Well, first of all, the more different you are, the more unique you are, the better you are because the world needs more special sauce. It doesn't need another bland perspective on something that is, you know, the same as everything else. Like stop trying to be like the other, you know, crayons in the Crayola box, like be your own damn color, be the thing that you are because that is the uniqueness of you. And we really are all very different. And over all of these years and all these adventures I've been on, that's really the thing I've taken away the most is if I just show up in the world and continue to get better in my own self and just embrace who I am versus trying to be something different, I'm going to get out ahead much faster than trying to follow in other people's footsteps and try to figure out what they're going to do next and how are they going to show up and how is that business going to try and do it and what's our competitor going to do like just blinders on right you're it you are driving your life car so to me being mexican being a latina entrepreneur it's it's fantastic i love it because it makes it different because i am unique because i had a different circumstance and now other young entrepreneurs and older entrepreneurs and frankly people in general can say all right, well, she's different and I'm different too. Maybe it's okay to be different. And I'm, what I'm saying is, fuck yes. Not only is it okay, it's awesome. Be a weirdo. Be different. That's fantastic. The world needs that. Amazing. Thank you for that. Medicine. Um, last thing, we are clearly emerging from the pandemic, however fast or slow, yeah. we're not going to get into the scientific arguments, but yeah. shit's changing. People are getting vaccinated. Yes. We're never going back to the way it was, but what's on the horizon for you? I mean, you, you've got lots of different stuff that's happening clearly, right? I mean, yeah. in, a, in addition to <laughs> your book, uh, again, dream first details later. Um, and in addition to, you know, Headley and Bennett, H and B, you, you, you know, there's so many things on the cusp, but what, what's going to be different for you as we emerge from this pandemic? And I'm asking this because I believe some people are going to get some ideas and hearing how a person who has navigated so much in their life is, yeah. you know, navigating this, what I'm thinking of it in terms of economic, emotional, societal, yeah. cultural, like um, reshaping. I'm just curious yeah. if you could, on the way out the door here, help us understand your your view and what, what you've learned and what you're doing 
differently as as we sort of re re-engage with the uh the rest of the world with the world <laughs> yeah i think we all just survived the craziest experience of our entire lives and in a weird way this is going to sound crazy but i think it's a little bit of a gift because we have never had an opportunity to get to assess our lives as deeply as we all assessed our lives last year. It was a real wake up call in so many ways. And we were all running so hard and so fast in the world. There were things that just were the way that they were. And for me, that was the biggest thing I took away from this is you cannot just continue to do what you're doing. You have to do it differently. And it's how I show up in my own home, how I spend time, what time I go home at night, not killing myself at the office all the time, but actually being willing to work remotely at times, being willing to shut off on the weekends, um, being, being willing to enjoy the world around me and actually live life a little bit. It's a different perspective than I had pre-COVID. And if we can't actually appreciate the beautiful life we have and show up for it, like, what the hell are we all doing? And so that was a real shift in my, in my universe. And I also have never been more grateful for my team. And it took me so long to go from being an independent person to a person who counts on others and who trusts others that now my team is my world and I want to do everything I can to help them be better. And I can't say that I was always with that perspective. I wanted to help all of us grow, but in a, in a big sort of fashion, in, a, in an idea that was a little more like glorious versus reality. And now I care deeply in my bones about the people around me being successful because I saw us all almost lose everything last year. So I, I walk into the future with more humility than I entered 2019 and 2020. And I'm just like, every day is a gift. And you better show up and make something happen today because you got another shot and you got another opportunity. And everybody should feel that right now. And to say, thank you, world, for surviving Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, you, for, for still being here. We made it to the other side, kind of. Um, and <laughs> we just got to like, <laughs> kind of. It's like sort of, we're sort of coming out of it. But yeah, but it's yeah. true, right? It's a gift. It's true. It's so true. Ellen Bennett, thank you so much, founder and CEO of Headley and Bennett. Uh, congrats again on the new book, Dream First, Details Later. Um, grateful to have you on the show. Is, is there any place you'd want to direct the audience in addition to buying the book? We're going to get this show out at pronto. Everybody who listens to the show knows how important it is to support authors, uh, books and as soon in their process as possible. So our community is going to get on it, but is there anywhere else you would steer us aside from, uh, buying the book? Where, where would you point what coordinates on the internet? Would you want us to go check out? <laughs> I love that. The coordinates of the internet. Well, you can definitely follow us on the old Instagram when you're feeling good, when you're feeling good only. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ellen Marie Bennett. You can also follow us at Headley and Bennett. We're on TikTok because it's highly entertaining and very bizarre and kooky in there, and I love it. And obviously go to our website. Check out our aprons and kitchen gear, headleyandbennett.com, and you can get signed copies of the book there for everybody. I actually had a bunch of people tell me that their kids, they're like 14, 15 year old kids grab the book that was sent to them and that they're crushing it. So this is really kind of spanning all ages. Dreams are for all kinds of people. So I really, I really hope people love this and enjoy it and embrace it and get out there and dream big. Well, thanks for doing something different with this book. It's beautiful and chock full of amazing information. And your story is uh, heartwarming and inspiring as hell. And I just wanted to say a personal thank you. Our, our community is going to show up for you. Um, I hope you have an amazing uh, rest of the day and week. Good luck with the rest of the book launch. Uh, and thank you so much for being on the show. Mm -hmm.